1 Kings chapter 4, verses 20 34. Hear the voice of God. It says, Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sands by the sea in multitude, eating and drinking and rejoicing. So Solomon reigned over all kingdoms from the river to the land of the Philistines, as far as the border of Egypt. They brought tribute and served Solomon all the days of his life. Now Solomon's provision for one day was 30 cores of fine flour, 60 cores of meal, 10 fatted oxen, 20 oxen from the pastures, and 100 sheep besides deer, gazelles, roebucks, and fatted fowl. For he had dominion over all the region on this side of the river, from Tifsa even to Gaza, namely over all the kings on this side of the river. And he had peace on every side around him. And Judah and Israel dwelt safely, each man under his vine and his fig tree, from Dan as far as Beersheba, all the days of Solomon. Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots and 12,000 horsemen. And these governors, each man in his month, provided food for King Solomon. And for all who came to King Solomon's table, there was no lack in their supply they also brought barley and straw to the proper place for the horses and steeds, each man according to his charge. And God gave Solomon wisdom and exceedingly great understanding and largeness of heart like the sand on the seashore. Thus, Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the men of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt, for he was wiser than all men. Then Ethan, the Ezrahite, and Heman, and Chalcol, and Darda, the sons of Mahol, and his fame was in all the surrounding nations. He spoke 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. Also, he spoke of trees from the cedar tree of Lebanon, even to the hyssop that springs out of the wall. He spoke also of animals, of birds, of creeping things, and of fish, and men of all nations, from all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom, came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. This is the inspired and inerrant word of God. May he bless its eternal truths to our souls. You may be seated when the children up through third grade are dismissed to their classes. been looking forward to starting this series in Proverbs. We're still doing something a little bit different. Um, even in the last five years that I've been pastoring here, Pastor Matt and I have sort of shared a, a sermon series. We've worked through a book together, and that's provided a lot of continuity and a lot of benefits, I think, on Sundays. And now we're going to seek to try something different and see the pros and cons of it. So as Pastor Matt is preaching through Ephesians, we're going to kind of bounce back and forth, not every week, but in little blocks. So we're going to begin Proverbs, and we'll ha kind of have these running parallel to each other throughout the next year or so. So we'll begin Proverbs this morning. It's something I've looked forward to for quite some time. Um, Proverbs is home to a lot of interesting passages of Scripture, isn't it? Some of them are famous favorites of ours that a lot of people would know. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your paths. Or something like the seven abominable sins, right? These things, these six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. And he goes on to list seven sins. Something very theologically weighty, like the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Things that even leak into culture and everybody says it. Pride goes before destruction. And an arrogant spirit before a fall. Um, uh, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. Or just very practical things like learn, learning to sort of discern between a disagreement with somebody else. The first one to plead his case, that seems right, until his neighbor comes and examines him. And you're like, ah, maybe that wasn't the whole story. 
Or some of the young people, a favorite, uh, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. So there's a lot of things that are kind of famous. There's some that are very controversial, uh, whether it's historically, doctrinally controversial, or just the idea of the topic. Historical doctrinal one would be like wisdom in Proverbs 8, and it says that wisdom was brought forth as the first creation, and Jesus was often associated with wisdom, so it caused a lot of theological turmoil in the first few centuries, or one that's maybe just Commonly controversial, like, he who spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. Hmm. Interesting, right? There's a lot of things that are kind of controversial, would stir up discussion in the book of Proverbs. There's a lot of humor in the book of Proverbs as well. Uh, Whoever loves instruction loves knowledge, but he who hates correction is stupid. Uh, Or as a ring of gold in a pig's snout. So is a lovely woman who lacks discretion. Go to the ant, you lazy son, right? You sluggard, consider her ways and be wise. Uh, Rebuke is more effective for a wise man than if you were to punch a fool a hundred times. Let a man meet a bear robbed of her cubs rather than a fool in his folly. You'd rather meet a bear and you're between her and her babies, then meet a fool in this accumulation of foolishness. All sorts of things. Even There's a, one about a lazy man. A lazy man just sticks his hand in the cookie jar, basically, but he's so lazy that he can't even raise a cookie to his face. So there's all sorts of sort of funny things as well. He uses humor to teach a point. There's also some very haunting warnings. A lot of these two path illustrations, and one is the path to life, one to death. Ten, uh, Proverbs 10, 6, and 7 says, Blessings are on the head of the righteous, but violence covers the mouth of the wicked. The memory of the righteous is blessed, but the name of the wicked will rot. A lot of beautiful poetry as well. The Lord by wisdom has founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. By his knowledge, the depths were broken up and clouds dropped down the dew. The glory of young men is their strength, and the splendor of old men is their gray head. And we'll get into, later on, we'll get into the picture of, of wisdom as a woman. There's a lot of beautiful poetry around her and who she is and what she's offering and how she calls to young people. So there's all sorts of magnificent things. We know, especially in the latter two-thirds of the book, there's a lot of different topics that are covered. You know, you get some parenting, you get handling money, you get how to have, how to have a good work ethic, the importance of the things that we say in speech, our relationships with each other, marriage, friendships, uh, aging, all sorts of things. You know, a wide array of topics are covered. And so Proverbs really teaches us how to understand life and it sheds light on the ways of God and the ways of men in the world so that we might then, with this light being shed upon our path, we might then walk with insight and with steadiness, a smooth path in front of us. And so we might ask, so if this is the book of books about wisdom and how to live, who wrote that? Where did this guy come from, and who is he right, to say that he's got it figured out, or that he's wiser than everybody else? The authorship of wisdom literature in general, but particularly of Proverbs, is very important. There, there are a few times in Scripture that the human author behind the book has particular meaning. You know, Moses behind the Pentateuch has particular meaning. No one else writes the Pentateuch. It's just, it's just him, or some of the uh, like the Psalms, we know as they're very Davidic because his, he's this musical shepherd and he's a king. And there's a lot of things about him that make the Psalms that he's written particularly meaningful. You jump to the New Testament and you have this premier example of Paul. You know, that he's this opponent of the cross of Christ and you have this road to Damascus conversion. And it's him that's ministering in such a significant way to, this, to the world in the first century. So sometimes the author, the human author even, behind the text is particularly meaningful. And that's certainly true when you say, here's the book of books on how to live. Who is this person? Now, it's not exclusively Solomon. I should say that. It's a composite book, but it's mostly Solomon. He writes probably 80 80 plus percent of it. 
Uh, there's some other people later on that compile some things that he said, as well as write chapters 30 and 31 are not written by Solomon. And there, then the book would be arranged to a degree anyways by some, by some scribes later. Um, but Solomon as a person. So we wanted to start this morning by considering Solomon. Now, if you know him already, if you're familiar with the story, which I know most are, then that inspires some confidence and it probably also inspires some questions or some uncertainty, maybe a little doubt. Are we sure that he is truly qualified to write this book? So we're considering this morning the rise and the fall of Solomon. And that's told a few times in the Old Testament, but we're going to look at 1 Kings 1 through 11. We're just going to tell the story of Solomon today. There's one text I'd like to consider as a prerequisite to that, and it's 1 Chronicles 22, 8 and 9. This is David recounting the word of the Lord that came to him concerning his son Solomon as it regards building the temple. And it's a very poetic text, it's a very poetic prophecy, but it sets up some of the contrast. So remember on our call to worship, we read Isaiah 9. Keep in mind that the Prince of Peace has been promised, and that's Jesus. And of his government and of his rule, there will be no end. Now we have this. Compare these two and begin to set up maybe where we'll go at the end of the sermon, contrasting these two kings. But God has says to David that you've shed much blood and have made great wars, so you shall not build a house for my name, that's the temple, because you've shed much blood on the earth in my sight. He was a man of war. He was a conqueror. Behold, a son shall be born to you who shall be a man of rest, and I will give him rest from all his enemies all around. His name shall be Solomon, for I will give peace and quietness to Israel in his days. He shall build a house for my name, and he shall be my son, and I will be his father, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. So there's a prophecy that David's that David receives concerning his son. And uh, it's that he'll have a son and he should name his name Shalomo, Solomon. And that's uh, related very closely to the word for peace. It's like he's a peaceful king. He's the king of peace. So you can see there's two uses of blood considering David. Then God says he'll give rest twice and then he uses peace twice. So keep that in mind that this is who this child is that's born of David and Bathsheba. He is the prince of peace. And he's going to bring Israel together. And the whole world is going to look at Israel when Solomon is king. So 1 Kings 1 through 11, it begins uh, with David being an old man. He's an old king. He's very frail. And right, He's only the second king of the United Kingdom. You had Saul before him, and then David inherited the kingdom from Saul. David's this man after God's own heart. He's the shepherd king, the the one who plays the harp, the one who writes the songs, the one who carries the sword, and he is dying. He's so frail that he cannot so much as keep warm at night. And so that's the setup to the book, is that, is that David is dying. You can imagine, I mean, this is, again, the king after God's own heart, and the kingdom is established and flourishing and healthy under him. So to inherit that is a very intimidating thing. It's like the father's handing his business empire to his son, don't mess this up. I've spent a lot of time working on this, and I'm now handing it to you. So I hope that it will flourish for another generation. So David is old. He's frail. One of his other sons, a son older than Solomon named Adonijah, he sees an opportunity to take the kingdom from his frail dad. And so he gathers to himself some military and religious leaders, both of which are kind of important in a coup, along with family and friends and the royal court, and he goes out to try to take the crown for himself. So he gathers these people together, and they go and sacrifice, and they begin to have this feast, and they say, long live King Adonijah. And now he has been, in his own world anyways, crowned king. Now Nathan the prophet, you may remember him from previous interactions with David, Uh, Nathan the prophet hears that this is going on. He was not invited to the party. Neither were a few of David's other very loyal friends. He hears that this is going on, so he goes to talk to Bathsheba. He says, we need to go talk to old King David here because he doesn't know what's going on, and he's about to have the kingdom ripped out of his hand. 
So they are cunning, they're scheming in a good way. They say, here's the plan. Okay, you go first, then I'll come after you, and we'll let them know what's going on, and and we're going to try to get Solomon on the throne, because that's what David had intended to do anyways. So Bathsheba goes and talks to David, and Nathan goes and talks to David. David's upset, and he says, okay, well, yeah, you're right. We need to get get Solomon on the throne. And so he sends them out to go and to crown, to anoint Solomon. So Nathan goes, and Zadok the priest goes, uh, and Benaiah, who's this really strong like, like military dude, he goes, and they go and anoint Solomon as king. And they sing, he's in uh, chapter 1, verse 39, Zadok the priest takes the horn of oil from the tabernacle, and he anoints Solomon, and then they blew the horn, and all the people said, long live King Solomon. So we have two kings now, but one has been anointed by the existing king, therefore has authority. Now, Adonijah and his crew are out in the field, and they hear the horn blow in Jerusalem, and they, and they hear everybody partying and the noise, and they're like, oh, what's going on over there? And then the man named Jonathan, who's loyal to them, he runs and he tells them, he's like, okay, good news, good news, and he's like, no, no, bad news, bad news. <laughs> so Solomon just got anointed king too, and we're in trouble. So then the entire feast, just like everybody scatters, and they're like, we weren't here, we weren't here, we weren't here. And uh, Adonijah, he's like, my only chance, his strategy, he says, my only chance is to run straight to the altar, to grab the horns of the altar, and to beg for my life there. Because it's traditional in this day that a new king takes out his enemies as his first act, and then, especially if there's any competitors to the crown, and then he's able to begin his reign in peace. King Peace is about to have a reign of peace, so you want to you be on his good side. So Solomon is merciful, and he says, go home <laughs> at the end of chapter 1, and things are sort of set, set up. So now the, the days, chapter 2, drew near uh, that David's going to die. And so he calls Solomon to him, and he gives him this really beautiful blessing. It's a good father-to-son blessing says, I'm going the way of all the earth. I'm dying. I'm turning to dust. Be strong, therefore, and prove yourself a man, and keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his judgments, and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. It's a good word. And then he goes on to give him some kingly advice. And he says, okay, there's a few people you need to know about and you probably are going to have to take care of as soon as you get into the office of king. And so he says, first of all, remember Joab? Joab was uh, his, David's military commander and he turned on him and he had betrayed him and, and killed a few innocent men. And so he says, remember Joab, don't let his gray hair go down to the grave in peace. Yes, dad. <laughs> yes, king. Okay, so handle Joab. But, verse 7, show kindness to the sons of Barzillai, the Gileadite. There were some people that were kind to me, and so you treat them kindly. Verse 8, there's another guy, Shimei. Remember this person who came out with a curse against David? And David had promised him that he would not put him to death with the sword. But son, you're not me, are you? All right, he says, okay, so you don't hold him guiltless. You're a wise man. You know what you ought to do to him but bring his gray hair down to the grave with blood. So he's like, in a very kingly way, he's handing the throne to his son. Hard decisions to be made, some judgments to be measured, and you need to do so righteously, but here's, here you go, before I die, last words, a few people to take care of. And so then David died. He rested with his fathers, and he was buried in the city of David. Solomon sits on the throne. He's, he's established, and the kingdom is firmly established. It's as strong or stronger than it has ever been before. So, chapter 3, starting in the middle, Solomon begins to do what David has told him to do. And so, there's a situation where Adonijah, who's been told to go home, and he says, tread carefully, but you're fine. Remember this, the, the other king, the other supposed king. Well, he has a bad idea. And he goes to Bathsheba. Adonijah goes to Bathsheba, Solomon's mom. And he's like, hey, I have one request. You remember that young woman, the maiden, that was helping to keep David warm? He says, I want to marry her. 
And Bathsheba's like, okay, I'll go talk to Solomon. Bathsheba goes and asks Solomon, and Solomon, for whatever exact reason, takes great offense to the request. And he sends his Navy SEAL, Bariah, and he says, take him out. So Adonijah dies, the initial enemy, right? These are all threats to the throne. That's the idea. There's threats to the throne, and they're all just being put away. They're all being eliminated. Okay, so Adonijah's gone. And then Abiathar, he was the priest that went with Adonijah and was anointing him against the wishes of David. So to Abiathar, he says, you know what? I'll be gracious to you because you were kind to my dad before, and you were loyal to him, and you even suffered with him. So you just exiled. Get out. Don't ever come back. Joab, you've shed innocent blood. So the previous military leader of David, um, he also runs to the altar, worked for the guy before him for a little while. He runs to the horns of the altar. David sends Abaniah there again. And he's like, hey, he's clinging to the altar, like begging for mercy and begging for life. And David's like, then kill him at the altar. <laughs> and so he dies there. So what's happening is now all these threats are going away and a new cabinet is being established. People who are loyal to Solomon. And then there's this last guy, Shimei, right, the one who had cursed David. Well, Solomon's merciful to him in that he sets him up with a deal. He says, go ahead and build a house in this spot and stay on the property. If you leave the property, you die. And so I think it's for three years or so. Uh, and Solomon said, or uh, Shimei says, okay, good, thank you. Whew, good deal, I like it. I'll live on this property for the rest of my life. And uh, then it happens a few years in that a few of his servants run away. Whether they know, you know, like, hey, you can't catch me, I'm off your property, uh, or what it is, but they, they go and leave. And he chases them down, brings them back to the property. Solomon finds out, Shimei's gone. He says, you broke the word. You said it was a good deal. And now, like, I have, to keep my end of the, I have to keep my end of the bargain. Okay, so now there's, with all the bloodshed, there's peace. No enemies that we know of to the Solomonic throne. So he knows that his primary responsibility is to build the house of God, to build the temple. So he's, he's seeking to do some prep work for that. I think he's probably intimidated by the kingdom that he's inherited. So he's going to worship in chapter 3. And this is a very unusual text. It's wonderful. It's interesting. It's certainly unusual. We're going to start in verse 4, and I'm going to read through verse 15. Chapter 3, the king is at Gibeon, and he's going there to sacrifice. There's no temple built yet. This is one of the high places, one of the biggest high places, and I think he probably went there in part because he has really big sacrifices, and it was a place that had capacity. <laughs> and so he goes there because that's the greatest high place. Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings at that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appears to Solomon the first of two times in his life in a dream by night, and God says, ask, what should I give you? I know we would argue against this comparison all the time, so pardon the comparison, but this is a lot like a genie wish. Like God comes to him and says, you have one wish. Make it count. What do you want? And he's this new king. He's like, oh, wow. I'm the strongest king in the world. I've just inherited this kingdom. What do I want? And Solomon says, you've shown great mercy to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in truth. He's going to go on. We're actually going to skip. Therefore, in verse 9. So he says, he's, you've been faithful to, to God. I'm a little child. I don't know what I'm doing with this kingdom. Verse 9. Therefore, give to your servant, here's my wish, an understanding heart to judge your people that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? So discernment is what he asks for, so that he would be a wise ruler, a ruler of righteousness. And this speech, verse 10, pleases the Lord. This is good that Solomon had asked this thing. 
God said to him, because you've asked for this thing and have not asked for long life, well, immortality. Ooh, yeah, maybe that, that, maybe that would have been a good one. Maybe I should have asked immortality. No, he says, you haven't asked for long life for yourself. You haven't asked for riches for yourself, nor have you asked for the life of your enemies. You just asked for yourself to have understanding, to discern me, like to discern justice. Behold, I have done according to your words. See, I have given you a wise and understanding heart so that there has not been anyone like you before you, nor shall any like you arise after you. And I also gave you everything else you could have asked for. I give you riches and honor so that there would not be anyone like you among the kings all your days. So if... Uh, You walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked. Then I will lengthen your days. And if you've you've read Proverbs, you know that a lot of these things are some of the things that are are guarantees in Proverbs. Like this long days, long life, these riches and health, honor. That sort of thing accompanies the life of the wise, the life of the righteous. And we'll get into that conversation down the road. But here it's all given to Solomon on the front end. God just opens the storehouse of heaven and pours out upon Solomon more wisdom than anyone had ever inherited before. There's an illustration immediately after that of one of his wise decisions, one that he apparently became well known for as he came back to Jerusalem and began to rule. There were two harlots that came to him, and they both had had children. And the one had unintentionally smothered her child in her sleep. Because she was so heartbroken, and she's this new mom and wants a child, she swaps babies with the other woman. Well, when the mom of the living child wakes, she's She wakes and she says, well, that's not my child. You have my child. And so they go to Solomon to to seek wisdom. And if you put yourself in Solomon's shoes, it it is tricky. (laughs) That's not easy. Like, whose kid is whose? Uh, Good question. This is pre-DNA testing, right? We don't know. How do you just discern? It's two harlots' words against each other. I don't know, guys. You work it out. No, Solomon has the wise idea. He says, okay, well, bring me a sword. And they bring him a sword. He says, I'm just going to cut the live baby in half and give half to each of you guys, because I don't know. And the one mother says, no, 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 no. Don't do that. Just give it to her. Let her raise the child. And then the second woman, not very smart, but she says, okay, if that's what you want to do, that's what you want to do. I guess we'll both have half of a, half of a baby. And so Solomon says, well, there's the decision. It's very clear. The mother who would sacrifice even being the mother of her child for the life of her child is the true mother. And this Israel hears the judgment which the king had re- the judgment, the judgment which the king had rendered. And they feared the king, for they saw the wisdom of God was in him to administer justice. So then this is like the budding of the kingdom, and it just flourishes, it expands, it grows. Solomon becomes wealthy beyond imagination. And that's what we read in chapter 4, and that's the portion that we read earlier, um, that he sets these governors up, and his cabinet is large, and, and then he goes, and it's like it, Judah and Israel are successful and flourishing everywhere, and there's peace on every side. He's not even in battle at all, and he has thousands upon thousands of stalls of horses for his chariot, and thousands of horsemen. It's just everything, a massive royal court that eats impressive amounts of food on a daily basis. And in a significant moment too, you have that every man had his own vine and his own fig tree. Right? Is everyone as rich as Solomon? No, but they all had their own little piece of heaven. They all had their own little plot. And that's a part of this shalom kind of a kingdom that everyone's has their little boundary and the lines have fallen to everybody in pleasant places. They're not all trying to be Solomon, but wow, what a, what a time to be alive in the kingdom, an Israelite in the kingdom of Solomon. I just want to reread 33, or 29 through 34. God gave Solomon wisdom 
and exceedingly great understanding and largeness of heart like the sand on the seashore. Thus Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the men of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt, for he was wiser than all men. A few are listed. Verse 32, he spoke 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. And it wasn't just justice and righteousness and being a king. Look at all the other things he was the leading expert in, trees uh, and animals and birds and creeping things and fish and everyone flocks. Think about the end. Think about Revelation and how this, this parallel is still being built, right? Verse 34, and all men of all nations from all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. So the world is flocking to Jerusalem to hear one man, one king, the author of Proverbs. So now with the grandness of his kingdom established, he says, then I have a job to do. I'm building a house for God that God didn't even let David do. And so the luxury expands even more. In chapter 5, he prepares to build the temple. And this, this is, I think, actually a very cool little historical piece. You kind of have letters from a few kings going back to each other, like notes from the richest dudes in the world. And they're just like, hey, I would like this. I want the best of the best from your kingdom because you guys know what's up and you know how to do that better than anyone in the world. He says, sure thing. Uh, What do you want for it? Uh, Whatever you ask, I'll send it up. Okay, where do you want me to drop it? There you go. And they're just like sending loads and loads of the greatest goods in the world back and forth in order to prepare for the building of God's house, the temple. So, There's a lot of things that go on here in 5 and 6. We're not going to get into the details uh, today of the temple and exactly what it looked like or how the the dimensions of it or all of the pieces of it. Um, But know that this is the most probably luxurious, expensive, single building of its size that's ever been built. There's a theoretical picture of it. Okay, so he's, he's building this place. And at the end of 6, or 6.11, God not appears to Solomon, but sends a word probably through the prophet. And he says, hey, about this house, <laughs> about this temple you're building me, this room for God. If you walk in my statutes, execute my judgments, keep all my commandments and walk in them, then I will perform my word with you, which I spoke to your father David, and I will Dwell among the children of Israel. I'll live in your house. Keep my commandments. I'll be with you. It's a very big statement from the divine that he'll bless them in this way. So he builds the outside and he adorns the inside. And uh, again, David's done a lot of the prep work for this, but now four years into his reign, Solomon begins constructing it. And uh, there's massive quarried stones that are a part of it, luxurious wooden beamed, intricately carved details, pomegranates, trees, flowers, cherubim, and gold, everything, everywhere. It takes him seven years to build it. Seven years later, he finishes building, at least the building portion of it, inside and out. So that's the end of chapter six, the last line. So he was seven years in building it. And it seems as though, this is a little bit debated, not positive on this point, but it seems as though then there's a pause between the building of the house and the furnishing of the house, so all of these other things that are outside, the lavers and uh, the oxen and the altar, that seems to come later. There's this little pause. So seven years building God's house, and then chapter 7, verse 1, but Solomon took 13 years to build his own house. Now Solomon's house is way bigger than this. Solomon has a lot more to do as king. He has a lot more people and servants that are doing, uh, doing stuff for him in this massive kingdom than are in the Lord's house. It makes sense that the buildings are bigger. That's fine. Even then. It even makes sense that it takes longer. But it does sound a little odd, doesn't it? It does sound a little odd, and it's accentuated in the text. That there's this like six years for God's house and 13 years for all of Solomon's house. And look at these things he built. The house of the forest of Lebanon and the hall of pillars and the hall of judgment and a house for him and a house for Pharaoh's wife and all, it's just all this stuff. And you're like, interesting. 
And some commentators have made the argument, and that's why we have this sort of arrangement in the chiastic structure, that there does seem to be this turn that you see, uh, is Solomon going to stick with this? Is Solomon loyal to God? Looks like he is. Up to this point, it sounded like he is. And even afterwards, I'd argue against some of the commentators' points. It's like, no, it seems as he furnishes and then Yahweh meets with Solomon. Like a lot of these things are still very bright and big and hopeful. But there seems to be a literary turn here. Solomon's attention on himself. So he builds all these other buildings for 13 years. After he's done with that, middle of chapter 7, he now furnishes the temple. And that's all of these other bronze, these ma- so massive that they couldn't even weigh them. They didn't know how much bronze was being used because all of these are just cast out of bronze, these external uh, things here, the, the place for washing and the altar, and then a few mobile wash stations as well on these carts. Um, and there's a guy, the expert, that uh, his name is also, it's close to Hiram, it's Hiram from Tyre, and he's a bronze worker, very skilled. Probably mention him next week again. So he makes all these things, and they're all brought to the temple. And then in chapter 8, once everything's sort of set up, right? God's house is built outside and in. Solomon's houses are all built outside and in. God's house is furnished with all of these bronze things outside, and then all gold things inside, and we're really ready. It's like moving day for God to move into the house. And so what do they bring? What might be the last piece, the crowning jewel of the temple? It's the Ark of the Covenant. And so Solomon gathers and all of the people of Israel gather and they make this assembly. And it's, it's absurd how, how wild this assembly is. That uh, King Solomon gathers in, in this verse 5 of chapter 8. King Solomon, all the congregation of Israel who were assembled with him, and they were taking the Ark, sacrificing sheep, And oxen, so many that couldn't be counted or numbered for multitude. It's like they're sacrificing all these animals as they bring God's ark into God's house. Verse 6, And the priests brought in the ark of the covenant of the Lord to its place, into the inner sanctuary of the temple, to the most holy place under the wings of the cherubim. For the cherubim spread their two wings over the place of the ark, and the cherubim overshadowed the ark and its poles. The poles extended so that the ends of the poles could be seen from the holy place in front of the inner sanctuary, but they could not be seen from outside, and they are there to this day. Nothing was in the ark except the two tablets of stone which Moses put there at Horeb when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. And it came to pass, verse 10, when the priests came out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of God so that the priests could not continue ministering because of the cloud. For the glory of Of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Then King of Peace speaks. The Lord said he would dwell in the dark cloud. I have surely built you an exalted house. And a place for you to dwell in forever. Solomon goes into this grand speech. He says I knew that this would happen. This was prophesied of my father David. And he handed the responsibility to me. And here we are. These four years into his reign, plus however many years later, seven plus 13 probably. So he's pretty far into his reign, and he completes the work. And he turns and he says, this is exactly what God has said would happen. And he gives this prayer of dedication, and he asks God. There's this pattern that happens starting in verse eight, uh, 30, chapter 8, verse 31. And he says, when something goes wrong in Israel, God... And Israel turns and calls on you. Will you please hear them from this house? And will you forgive them? So when anyone sins against his neighbor, 
do this here and when they, when they repent here and justify the righteous. Verse 33, when your people are defeated before an enemy because they've sinned and then they turn back to you and confess and pray and make supplication to you in this temple, then hear in heaven and forgive the sins of your people. Verse 35, when the heavens are shut up and there's no rain. Verse 37, when there's famine in the land and pestilence. Verse 41, when a foreigner comes and they gather to our people, they convert. Verse 44, when your people go out to battle against the enemy. Verse 46, when they sin against you. And all of these occurrences and all of these types of things that could happen, and many of them being things that are going wrong. And he says, but the people turn and they call to you in this temple. Then hear from heaven and forgive us. So he's calling upon the temple to be the place where God meets his people. And then Solomon blesses the assembly and he dedicates the temple. And they have a massive feast, unimaginably large. Feasting for days upon days upon days. So he's doing it. Solomon's doing it. He's the wisest king because why? God... Well, how did that happen? Because God gave it to him. God blessed him with wisdom. And so he built the kingdom. He built his house. He built God's house. It's all going mag- magnificently well. Chapter 9. Verse 1. It came to pass when Solomon finished building the house of the Lord and the king's house and all Solomon's desire, which he wanted to do. So you hear of this a little bit in Ecclesiastes. We saw a little bit in 1 Kings 4. We'll see it a little bit. It's so like Solomon's done everything. He's built it all. He's bought it all. He's experimented with it all. He's done everything. There's no one that's had as much experience in life as Solomon has had. So when all that's done, God returns to him. He says, okay, let's have one more conversation here. Verse 3, and the Lord said to him, I have heard your prayer and your supplication that you have made before me. And I have consecrated this house, which you have built to put my name there forever, and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. Now, if you walk before me as your father David walked in integrity of heart and in uprightness to do according to all that I have commanded you, and if you keep my statutes and my judgments, then I will establish the throne of your kingdom over Israel forever, as I promised David your father, saying, you shall not fail to have a man on the throne of Israel. Wow. So it's like saying to the person who's the most gifted person in the world, hey, if you just keep doing the thing you're gifted in, this is going to work forever. He's already been given wisdom by God, and he says, yeah, just keep being wise. You've got it all from me. But if by some like miracle of condemnation, if by some feat you're able to not be wise as I've gifted you to be. If you or your sons turn from following me and you don't keep the commandments and you don't keep the statutes which I've set before you, but you go and serve other gods and you worship them, then I will cut off Israel from the land which I have given them and this house, this temple, which I have consecrated for my name and I will cast out of my sight. Israel will be a proverb and a byword among all peoples. And as for this house which is exalted, everyone who passes by it will be astonished and will hiss and will say, why has the Lord done this to this land and to this house? And then they will answer, because they forsook the Lord their God who brought their fathers out of the land of Egypt and embraced other gods and they worshiped them and served them. Therefore, the Lord has brought all this calamity on. I'll tear it all down if you walk away from me. I'll destroy this house. I will leave this house if you don't follow me. The rest of chapter 9 continues to say big things about the kingdom, but there's some, for the first time, a little lack of peace. Hiram, the great king, you know, the notes that went before between these two richest guys in the world, Hiram's not happy. Hiram says, I don't, like the, I don't like the cities you gave me as my payment. Hmm, tension. And then Solomon, 
He does all of these other things. He continues building. Chapter 10 is this very famous visit from the Queen of Sheba. Yes, she's a real person. And yes, she's here uh, visiting Solomon. And so she visits and she's like, okay, I've heard about you, but this is, wow, I didn't hear anything about like that this was true. The, the, the legends are not even as big as the reality is. It's a true report that I heard. And she brings all of these gifts to him. Um, she says, I didn't even, in chapter 10, verse 7, I didn't even believe the words until I came and saw with my own eyes, and indeed the half of it wasn't told me. Your wisdom and prosperity exceeded the fame which I heard. Happy are your men. Happy are your servants who stand continually before you and hear your wisdom. Blessed be the Lord your God who delighted in you, setting you on the throne of Israel, because the Lord has loved Israel forever. Therefore, he made you king to do justice and righteousness, these things that he's gifted in, and he knew he needed, because every king, when they come into the throne, they had to, Deuteronomy commanded them, they all had to write out the law themselves, and they had their own copy that they wrote, and they took it with them, and they read it daily, and they were compelled to keep it. He says, this is too great for me, and God gifted him to keep it, and he commanded him, to keep it. And she says, look at you, keeping it. So she gifts him many things, and he gifts her many things. So much so, and we could keep reading, it just keeps getting, it builds, it builds, it builds. But chapter 10, 27 has a cool note in it. It says, the king made silver as common in Jerusalem as rocks. It's like silver's like dirt. It doesn't mean anything. The, it's, the value has gone down so much. And cedar trees, like the best kind of wood that you could own, that's just like sagebrush. It's everywhere. We're that rich. It's ridiculous. That's why Solomon wrote Proverbs. For all of these reasons, that he was divinely gifted with not just skill for himself, but he was divinely gifted with God's wisdom. And we'll detail that out more in the weeks to come, what that exactly is and means. But what he asked for, it gives us insight. The ability to discern and to make the right calls as a king, to, to, to judge well, to lead well, to live well. And God says, I gave all of that to you. So that's why Solomon, more than any king before him or any king after him, is uniquely gifted to write this book. And other books in wisdom literature too. Song of Songs and Ecclesiastes. So he's the guy. But as much as he's been climbing, 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 and he's just at this pinnacle, we turn to chapter 11. And it seems like everything just crashes to the ground. But King Solomon loved many foreign women, as well as the daughter of Pharaoh. He loved women of the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites, from the nation of whom the Lord had said to the children of Israel, you shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you. Surely they will turn away your hearts after their gods. And Solomon clung to these in love. He had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. And his wives turned away his heart. For it was so when Solomon was old that his wives turned his heart after other gods and his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father David. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and did not fall, fully follow the Lord as did his father David. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, on the hill that is east of Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the people of Ammon, and he did likewise for all his foreign wives who burned incense and sacrificed to their 
gods. So the Lord Yahweh became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord God of Israel who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods. But he did not keep what the Lord had commanded. Therefore the Lord said to Solomon, because you have done this and have not kept my covenant and my statutes which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. Nevertheless, I will not do it in your days for the sake of your father, David. I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away the whole kingdom. I will give one tribe to your son. Not for your sake, but for the sake of my servant, David, and for the sake of Jerusalem, for the sake of Zion, for the sake of Revelation 21 and 22. And so, in chapter 11, then you see adversaries arise. There's people who begin to come against Solomon. And unlike at the beginning, when it looked like this guy, he could strike against somebody and they were gone. Right? He was able to eliminate any opposition, have a smooth path, a peace on all sides. Now, ooh, fights, wars on all sides. And he goes after people and he can't take them down. They evade him. And the kingdom is split into 12 pieces and a prophet comes to Solomon's servant Jeroboam and he offers him the kingdom. He says, take 10 pieces of this cloth that I've ripped up to represent the 12 tribes of Israel, but we'll leave a few for Solomon's son. And we see the exact thing that God prophesied take place, that Solomon's son, Rehoboam, he's unwise Very ironic as we get further into Solomon's words in Proverbs. But the kingdom is torn from him. And then he ends in the end of chapter 11. Now the rest of the Acts of Solomon, they're written in other places. Uh, Verse 42, in the period that Solomon reigned in Jerusalem, over all Israel was 40 years. And Solomon rested with his fathers and was buried in the city of David his father. And Rehoboam his son reigned in his place. You know what's not said about him? That he died at a good age, full of days, riches, and honor. That he followed the Lord his God to the last. No, he just slept with his fathers and was buried with his dad. There's a lot of lessons that we could take from this. A few moral ones, and then we need to primarily examine the the contrast between Solomon and and Jesus, and instill some confidence in why we could continue to read Proverbs. So, moral lessons. Number one, the fall of Solomon does revolve around his heart being turned to people who are out of the covenant. Now, there's the problem, there's various problems in what Solomon did, but one of them, the primary one that's addressed, is the fact that covenants with people outside the covenant Even his marriages and his affection toward people who hated his God, even though they might not say they hated his God, they just loved other gods. That brought Solomon and the kingdom and peace to an end. He was done because he let his heart follow other people outside of the covenant. So there's a warning within Marriage, and I'd say this particularly to the young men and women, marry people who love the Lord who made them. That will bring blessing in such a way that you, you, you think it might work out, and it may, because God may be abundantly gracious. But to act in such a way is contrary to wisdom and is embracing folly. I would encourage you to marry someone who loves God, who fears God, would be how Solomon would say it, even though he didn't do it very well. Then there's uh, the lesson of vigilance, and this is for everyone. New Testament would say, let him who stands take heed lest he fall. Peter would say, be vigilant, be aware, because your adversary, the devil, roams about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. There is the danger of a devastating finish to a life of faith. This is, not, and this is not the point of how it's written. It's not the emphasis of how it's written. It's not 
The question's not, was Solomon saved or wasn't Solomon saved? That's not the question. What you see is how he lived. And you see Solomon living, committing, walking with God. But walking with God early, as good and necessary as that is, does not mean you walk with God at the end. That's the lesson of Solomon. Continue walking in the path of faith. Continue resting in the grace of Christ. Do not check the box like, okay, well, I rested and now we're on to the next thing. No, no, this is our life. It's to wise men, wise women walk this path to their last breath. And Solomon did not. There was a warning from his dad in First Chronicles. And you, Solomon, my son, knowing the God of your father, and know the God of your father and serve him with a whole heart and with a willing mind, for the Lord searches all hearts and understands every plan and thought. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. Solomon himself said this in Proverbs 19, 27. Cease listening to instruction, my son, and you will stray from the words of knowledge. God himself warned him in 1 Kings 9, 6 through 9. The king of Proverbs became a proverb. Don't be like him. And the only reason then that we would listen to the book he wrote is because it's not just from Solomon. <laughs> it's from God. God filled Solomon with wisdom. And then it's deep irony that he used ultimately a fool to do it. It teaches us some very important lessons about the insufficiency of wisdom. That wisdom doesn't redeem you. It teaches us about the, the necessity to continue on the path, all of these things. Okay, so there's, and we'll get into a lot of that as we move into Proverbs. But the importance of vigilance, because you stand today, doesn't mean someone stands tomorrow. And now we need to contrast as we end, we'll close with this, the contrast between the king of peace that we've looked at and the king of peace that was prophesied in Isaiah, which we read this morning. Now, the, the contrast between these, te these two texts is very striking, that the father receives a prophecy about their son, and the name of their son is included. He says, and you shall name your son Peace, and you shall name your son Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. They both grew in wisdom. Solomon received it from the storehouse of God when God came to him and offered. Jesus grew in wisdom, and he grew in stature, and in favor with God and man. Solomon experienced a grand but temporary peaceful kingdom where every side he had rest. But in this king of peace that we sang about this morning, we have the hope of an eternal peaceful kingdom. That of his government and of his peace, there will be no end. That ultimately, we can't rest our hope in Solomon's words. Our hope is not in Proverbs. Proverbs leads us to hope. Proverbs teaches us wisdom. Proverbs teaches us skill of how to live. And if you live skillfully, you walk towards hope. But Jesus successfully obeyed. He is the one who fulfilled all righteousness. Solomon's reign ends in tragedy. Whereas Jesus' reign, we haven't seen the end of yet, but it's going to accumulate in triumph. So Solomon, the king of peace, who had all of the world gather to him and come and sit at his feet and listen to him, was he sufficient for these things? No, he was not. He disobeyed and he failed and he fell and he lost the kingdom. Is our Jesus like that? Is our king of peace like that? No, he's not. He is the prince of peace who has never once failed, who has never once faltered. And his kingdom, he has promised to continue building. And even the gates of hell, which succeeded against Solomon, will not succeed against King Jesus. It will be intact and it will flourish. So as we read Proverbs, here's some things Solomon might say. He might say something like, wait for God's justice, and he does. Well, Jesus is justice. He would say that there is this offer of life and long life and blessing, and even he'll, in an opaque way, offer life after death. And Jesus arrives and he says, here I am. 
I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. There's a beautiful text in Proverbs 8, the Lady Wisdom, she invites people to her table, particularly the young men, and she says, young men, come and eat at my table. I've prepared food, I've prepared drink, come and sit with me, and we will have peace. And what we're about to remember today is that Jesus says, I have prepared a feast. I am the feast. I am the bread of life. I am living water. I am the wine that, was, that flows freely. Come and eat of me, and you will live forever. Solomon was encouraged to and encouraged his son toward covenantal fidelity. Stay in the faith. Stay in the family. It's questionable whether he did. But Jesus doesn't just tell you. He enables you. He gives you life toward faith by his spirit. So Solomon, it looked like he was the ideal king. And he describes the ideal king in his words. And then the ideal king was born. And he lived. And he died. And he rose. And he ascended. And he will return. So our hope is not in Solomon's words. Our hope is in Jesus' words. But you will see as we move through Proverbs the beauty of the tapestry of Scripture as it draws us constantly to the one who has fulfilled all righteousness and would teach us to live after him.